that's awesome. You may be seated. Thank you. It's so great to be a part of such a big church family, isn't it? All the campuses everywhere and online joining us as well. And we get to gather together for a midweek, kind of bolster our faith together. But it has been an incredible series already in the book of in the book of uh, First Kings and talking about Elijah and his life and a man just as we are. And uh, we've been encouraged over the last couple of weeks already. Pastor Luke has brought the house down with each and every message. If you missed any of it so far, please go back and listen to it because it's going to build one week upon the next. And uh, God is doing a great thing. So I want to start off with just a few images on the screen. The first image, you know what that is, a stealth bomber. And the whole idea of a stealth bomber is that it would go undetected so it can get into enemy territory. And uh, it's the whole idea is to uh, avoid detection. Next, next image, uh, a chameleon. Blends in with every environment. It's pretty remarkable how God created that creature. And the next one, and what is that? That's disturbing, that's what that is right there. And that's how ridiculous we look, trying to blend into the world in which we live and not stand out, everybody. We, you know what all those images are? They're images about being undetected. Images about blending in, not trying to stand out, not trying to stir the waters or cause waves anywhere we go. But wherever you read the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or New Testament, it constantly tells us as people of God to stand out or to shine in the darkness. In fact, Philippians 2.15 says, you live among people who are crooked and evil, but you must not do anything they can say is wrong. Try to shine his lights among the people of this world as you hold firmly to the message that gives life. That's this word right here, to the message that gives life. And I bring this up because Israel is in a predicament and they're dealing with a problem that brought the prophet Elijah to the scene in the first place. And so I've titled the message tonight, Stand Up at the Showdown. All right, because this is a Western passage of scripture here. And Elijah, as we mentioned, is a man like, like as we are. He's a prophet of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, called to bring the people of God back to God. And the people of Israel were caught up in a culture where they were blending in. They just began to do the things that the culture said to do. And the reason that they were doing it is they had a wicked leader. They had a wicked king, King Ahab. And they didn't stand out, so naturally they were challenged by the men of God who would come out and stand firmly on faith in the word of God. And he would tell people over and over again, you need to turn back to God. And I tell you, the whole culture was going crazy. Uh, in fact, they were trying to kill every prophet that they could find in order to take them out so that the word of God would be silenced. Sounds a whole lot like America today, doesn't it? Try to take the word of God everywhere, out of school, out of, the, out of the public workplace, out of the marketplace, wherever you go. And the Bible says when you turn away from God, it automatically leads us to adopting idols in our life. And as Pastor Luke said in the first message, an idol is an unauthorized noun. It's a person, place, or thing that you look to to get your need met, it's your resource in life. Anything that takes the place of God. Now when you understand the biblical kind of definition of idolatry, then you understand that we can succumb to an idol in, in modern day society today. People can be sitting in church on Sunday and yet God is not their primary source. Their job is their primary source, or what it can be just about anything. It might be, you know, for some, they go to church and it's just additional insurance for them. Call it fire insurance. I don't want to go to hell, so I want to I want to believe in God. But tonight's passage really calls the people of God out from among the rest of culture, of society, so that you stand out like the stars in heaven in a dark place. And it's a very uncomfortable situation. First Kings chapter 18, here's Elijah. Then it happened. When Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? 
Ahab is looking for a fight, and he's about to get more than he can handle. Ahab's ticked off because Israel is experiencing a drought, and he's blaming Elijah for the famine. And Ahab is feeling pretty cocky. He's feeling unbeatable. It reminded me a lot as I was reading that text of Muhammad Ali. You know, the, you know, he was so audacious. He was so confident. He was so cocky. Remember some of his quotes? Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. His, hand, his hands can't hit what his eyes can't see. And he went on, now you see me, now you don't. He would say things like, it's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am. Yeah, I love that. If you even dream of beating me, you better wake up and apologize. <laughs> this is my favorite of all of them right here because I'd never heard it before. I should be a postage stamp. That's the only way I'll ever get licked. I mean, he was feeling <laughs> cocky. And then the fight came where pride goes before the fall. And you know the story. He's down on the ground and he had lost the fight. Well, this is Ahab. Ahab's filled with pride. Ahab was the king of Israel. That's who he is. First Kings 16 tells you all that you need to know about who Ahab is. Verse 30, it says, Ahab did what was evil in the Lord's sight, even more than any of the kings before him, believe it or not. And as though it were not enough to follow the sinful example of Jeroboam, he married Jezebel. And he began to bow down in worship to Baal. First, Ahab built a temple and an altar for Baal in Samaria. Then he set up an Asherah pole. He did more to provoke the anger, anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than any of the other kings of Israel before him. He's a king that is known for leading the people of God away from God. But really, Ahab shouldn't, shouldn't be known for the person who was leading them away. Really, it was Jezebel, his wife. He just didn't stand up. He just didn't have any leadership in himself. He just wanted to go along for the ride. And Jezebel, this, this wicked woman that was filled with demonic influence, was the greatest troublemaker of all. And yet, it's Ahab who says to Elijah, oh, there you are, O oh, troublemaker of Israel, to which Elijah responds. He says, I have not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now, who is Baal? Well, we know he's, it's a false god. It's an idol. It's a spirit. And ironically enough, you know what Baal is known for? It's, it's known for the god of rain and fertility. And here they are in a drought. Isn't that amazing? That the very God that you are worshiping, the very God that you sold out for, isn't supplying your need at all, and you're ticked off at the wrong person. You're ticked off at the wrong God. You ought to look at the God that you're trying to serve and see that it's a counterfeit because it can't give you what you're searching for. And there's Baal. Baal's whole agenda is to remove and replace. Bell's ultimate goal is to get you to remove God from being first priority in your life. And the Bible tells us that Baal caused Israel to forget God. Well, here we are in America. God kicked out of culture, out of education, out of government, out of media, out of the marketplace. And he, anytime God is taken out, he is replaced by other spirits. And Elijah says, you brought this on yourself because you're pursuing idolatry. You've caused the heavens to shut up. You caused the blessings of God to just disappear before your very eyes. And by the way, one of the reasons we're seeing <clears throat> all this chaos around the country today is because we have forsaken the Lord our God as a country. God is saying, if you don't want me, let me get out of the way and show you what life is like without me. And you look across the country and you see chaos and you see darkness and you see confusion happening everywhere and emptiness and empty promises because the gods of this world cannot provide what the God who created us can provide. And it's all because we remove God out of our lives. God removed from government, from schools, from the biblical definition of marriage from being removed from, from civics, and I'm so thankful for the civics ministry here that just got launched. Aren't you thankful that somebody's standing up? We can't even open up for prayer at a football game anymore. 
You can't even pray at a prayer breakfast anymore in the name of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? The irony of all of that. Think about that. You get invited as a pastor to a prayer breakfast in the city, and they say, well, you can pray, but this is how we want you to pray. Well, if you want to blend in, don't ask us to come, because we're going to pray in the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, believing for change, because that's how God moves. He moves through his spirit. I need, I'm going to drink to that. And here's the problem. Israel had experienced false gods for so long, they didn't know what the true God looked like anymore. For this next verse, I'm gonna need a little background music, and so I'm gonna read it and just let it play in the background. Because this is the setting, here it is. This is standing up at the showdown. First Kings 18, 19. This is a worship song, by the way. Hillsong wrote it. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Okay, enough music. That was it. That's all, that was my only idea I had that was creative right there. He says, <laughs> thank you, Pastor. Gather 850 of your false prophets. Gather them around. All of your spiritual advisors Invite Jezebel to come. Ahab, you show up and tell all the people of Israel to gather around for the showdown at Mount Carmel. And all of them, they begin to come together. And let's settle this once and for all, he says. So Ahab says, okay, you got a deal. Let's go for it. Verse, verse 20, Ahab sent word throughout all Israel, assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, and here's the strong word, how long will you waver between two opinions? I love that statement. Because I wanna tell you something about Elijah. He is one to 850 standing strong. And he tells Ahab, you gather all the people. And Ahab is just kind of, you know, shoulders are back and his chest is puffed out. He says, 850 to one, I'd be glad to bring them. And it'll be a showdown that no one will soon forget. And I'm going to tell you something, Elijah, you're going to die. And Jezebel had been looking for Elijah for a long time and couldn't catch him. So she, she killed as many prophets as she could, but she could never get Elijah. This was her opportunity. So let him show up. And he stands up and he says to the people of God, he doesn't speak to Jezebel, he doesn't speak to Ahab, he doesn't speak to the 850 prophets, false prophets, he speaks to the people of God and he says, how long are you going to waver between two opinions? When are you gonna get a backbone and stand up for the God who said that he's created you? And he said, if the Lord God is your God, then follow him. But if you're gonna follow Baal, then follow him. But the people said nothing. And friends, I'm telling you, this is the, we cannot let this happen in modern day society today. We can't remain silent. Oh, well, I'm just showing it through my lifestyle. Friends, we're beyond showing it through lifestyle. You gotta use your vocal cords and let people know what it is that you stand for because people are looking for direction. So, so how long will you waver between two opinions? In other words, you're just waffling back and forth, whatever is convenient for you. It's kind of like the guy who was driving and weaving in traffic and the police officer pulled him over on suspicion of drunk driving. He came up to the window, the guy rolled down the window, it was a southern guy and he rolled down the window. He could smell the alcohol coming out of the car. And he said, hey, you know the reason I pulled you over? He said, I don't, I don't really know why you pulled me over. He said, well, can you step out of the car? He gets out of the car and he says, well, I'm gonna have to ask you to take a breathalyzer. And he says, oh, I can't do that. He said, well, why not? He said, I'm an asthmatic. I can have an asthma attack. He said, well, I'm gonna have to take you down to the jail and we're gonna have to take some blood sample and we're gonna have to find out whether there's alcohol in your blood. He said, I can't do that either. He said, why not? I'm a hemophiliac. I'm gonna bleed to death if I do that. He said, well, then I'm gonna have to ask you to walk this straight line. He said, I can't do that either. He said, well, why not? I'm drunk. <laughs> yeah, so how long are you gonna waver between two opinions? Okay, three more images here real quick. 
First one is, now that is an armadillo in the middle of a road, and it's called a Texas speed bump. You know why? Because a half a million armadillos in Texas are run over every single year, and they call them hillbilly speed bumps out there because they just get to the middle of the road and they get run over by a car. It's like they never learn. They just get out there and wait right in the middle for something to hit them. I know a lot of Christians like that. Here's the next one. This is the next image. <laughs> it's time to get off the fence. That's pretty painful right there. One foot in the church, one foot in the world, one more, and this is really important. Hot or cold, you gotta choose. How many of you like cold coffee? Raise your hand. All right, put your hand down. How many of you like hot coffee? Uh, most of you. How many of you like them both? Go ahead, raise your hand. How many of you need a shot right now? Okay. Nobody orders lukewarm coffee. Hey, you know what? Can I have some of that stuff that's been sitting out for a few hours? It's the stuff in the middle that gets you hurt. That's why Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but lukewarm, I would spew you out of your mouth. And there's where the people of God are. Ahab is there, Elijah is there, Jezebel is there. He, she's somewhere in the background. All the prophets of Baal are there. But Elijah doesn't address any of them except for the people of God. He says, one minute you're singing songs to God, the next minute you're worshiping Baal. I can't figure out which it is. Which is it? Who are you gonna follow? It's time to stand up because we're gonna have a showdown. And how long are you gonna keep hearing the same sermon every week? That's what Elijah's saying, calling you to full commitment, but you say, I'm just not ready yet. And it says the people were silent. And then the people kind of say like, why are you so serious, Elijah? Take a chill pill. And Elijah says, look, if you think you can passively stand by and just blend into the crowd and expect God to bless your life, you're sadly mistaken. Remember why all of this has happened. They're in a drought. They're expecting something to happen. So if the bales don't answer, maybe God will. Maybe if I go to church on Sunday. Maybe if I read my Bible a little bit. What if I pray a little bit? But you, you haven't altered your life at all to follow him. You haven't gone all in to follow him. So don't expect a great blessing from God unless you're willing to go all in and count the cost. Pick up your cross and follow him every single day. It, it, you don't get this fairy dust sprinkled on your life because you go to church or because you call yourself a Christian, Elijah said. Then Elijah said to them in verse 22, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. I'm outnumbered, 450 to one, or really 850 to one. And Elijah felt like one man against the whole world. And by the way, he wasn't alone. If you read on, you find out that God says, I've got 100 more just like you saved up for latter times. And don't think you're too highly of yourself here, Elijah. I've got more in my pocket than you can ever imagine. And so don't be thinking that you're the only one ever standing up in your workplace or in your home life or wherever you are in society. God can use a lot of different people, but it is time for the people of God to stand up. And so this symbol of Baal was a bull, and I think that's very interesting. So Elijah says in verse 23, get two bulls for us. I love that. You know, God does everything on purpose. Baal is the symbolic image of Baal is a bull, so Elijah said, get two bulls, one for me and one for the prophets of Baal. And let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. In fact, you choose first so you don't think there's any trickery going on. And let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but do not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull, put it on the wood, but do not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, I'll call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So he calls for two bulls cut up for a sacrifice. Why a bull and not a lamb? Because this was not worship. This was about lordship. This was something different. God was gonna answer by fire. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12 says, our God is a consuming fire. One for the prophets, one for Elijah, and Elijah makes this statement, it's time to cut the bull. Now I can go somewhere with that. You know I could, but I'm not gonna. But it is time to call it like it is. 
It is time to cut through the chase. It is time to cut through the gray and make it black and white. And it's time to give God first place in everything. And then Elijah says, you call on the God Baal, I'll call on the name of the Lord. And he's challenging them to the very core of the greatness of their God. And he says, let's just see what your God can do right here, right now, because I'm sick and tired of watching this whole thing. And he's standing up in that society and saying, I'm here, I'm not running. If you wanna see something, call on your God. And he says, you first. And the prophets of Baal begin to, you know, worship a little bit quiet. They begin to, you know, kind of get into a little bit of a, a frenzy and nothing is happening. No answer all day. No answer. Now it's, it's going to get a little humorous here. Verse 27. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. He said, shout louder. He said, surely he's a God. Perhaps he's in deep thought. Or maybe he's busy, or maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shout louder. They slash, slash themselves with swords and spears as, as was their custom until their blood flowed. You talk about a, serving a God that doesn't answer. You gotta cut yourself in order to get any answer. Midday passed, they continued their frenetic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. Now the sun is going down, but there was no response. No one answered, no one paid attention. How do you stand up in a culture that says to stand down? Well, friends, number two is reignite your passion for God. I mean, just get fired up about who it is that you serve. Isaiah 69, nine says, passion for your house has consumed me and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. You know what he's saying there? When people blaspheme God, when people say, terrible things about Jesus, when people say terrible things about the church, you ought to take it personal because they're talking about your God. You ought to stand up and say, you know what, not around me. Don't come around me thinking that I'm gonna laugh at your jokes about God or the way that you kind of live your life and thinking that that's okay. It really is time for us not to be mean-spirited or rude, but it is time to stand up and say, wait a second, this is a sincere faith and I truly believe that he is the God of heaven and earth. He's the God who created me. I wanna honor him with the way that he says I ought to live. You may think it's foolish or old-fashioned, but I I believe in God. And friends, I don't think we ought to be ashamed. We ought to get a passion back in our hearts for the things of God. In other words, uh, you know, I'm so filled with zeal for the things of God that, you know what, if somebody insults God, I'm gonna take it personal. It's kind of like the, the, the young men from the University of North Carolina campus when all the, you know, the, the protesting was going on. There's a little video that you can watch and they, they were bringing the Palestinian flags in and they were bringing all this and they were about ready to take down the American flag and this sorority, the kind of these guys got together and said, you know what, we're gonna hold firmly to the United States of America flag and we're not gonna let them tear it down. And they just held on to it. I love that image so much because people talk about young people and how they don't have tenacity anymore, but we, the young people do, and there's a passion in them to do something that is worthwhile, and I don't know what their faith is as young people, but what I was proud of is that they stood up for something against a whole bunch of people and said, not in our country. We live in the United States of America, and that's wonderful, and that's great, but even greater, friends, is this word that we hold firmly to and we don't let go. We hold it up, we hoist it up, and together as the church of Jesus Christ, we don't let go. We stand firmly in the faith and we don't shrink back. That's what I love about the leadership of this church and the direction of this church. We need to reignite our passion for the things of God. Hold tightly to the word of God. Stand firm in our faith. Worship God with conviction. Pray with fervency. Honor God in the way we live. Serve other people. Be radical, generous, generous people. First Kings, back to the story. Verse 30 says, then Elijah called the people. I love this scene. And he said, come over here. Now they've just cut themselves up. They're all worn out. No answer from heaven, from the bales. And he says, okay, guys, how long are you gonna waver between two opinions? Come on over here. And he calls the people of God up close. And there were a bunch of stones that were laying that were scattered. 
there were 12 stones. And the 12 stones made an altar at one time, and the 12 stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And Elijah said, just gather around, and he puts the stones back together again. And he says, that's what this is for. This is the place of worship. This is the place of sacrifice. This is the place where you ought to come to God. They had gotten rid of all the sacrifice. They'd gotten rid of all the passion. They didn't deal with sin anymore. They just kind of went along with the flow of traffic and just said, you know, culture is what it is. Whatever the king says must be good. And he says, man, you gotta reestablish this altar again, man. You can't just walk away and just expect your life to turn out good and the blessings of God to flow. You want the blessings of God to flow? Restore the altar. Get back with God. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. It's the way God works. He's a jealous God. He wants first place in everything. So give him first place. And he took the 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Friends, religion can't change you. Religion can't help you. Religion certainly won't bring heaven down to earth, but you get a relationship at that altar. You can open that word, and you can kneel down at your bed or in your car, and before you go to work in the morning, just say, God, I wanna hear from heaven today. What is it that you want? in my life to, to be altered at this altar. God, have your way. Be first in my life. Have priority in my life. And he takes the, the bull and he places it on this altar and then he says, all right, dig a trench and pour water down on this, on this altar. I mean, he's, whoever, the God that answers by fire is the God who is the God, is, is, he's, the, he's the man. And he says, why don't you just pour some water on that thing? I mean, nothing worked for them. I'm gonna call on our God right now, but why don't you go ahead and put some water? I think that the irony of that is awesome too because they're in a drought. The very thing they're asking for, he says, why don't you go ahead and sow a seed right here in this altar and just pour some water in because it's about to rain if you get your heart right. If you get your heart right, God will open up the heavens and you may not see it right now, but God is getting ready to put a blessing on your life. If you just kneel down and if you just bow your heart, if you just surrender your life, he's about ready to pour blessing upon you. Even if you can't see it, I want you to trust him. And he tells all the people, go ahead, pour it on. Verse 36 says, and I gotta finish. The prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know, I love this prayer, Lord, that you are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Oh, I love that. Let them know, open the eyes of their heart that they know how much you love them right now. I mean, you think of Elijah and he's this brash guy and just comes in full force, doesn't have a heart for anybody. But here he is saying, God, let them know how much you love them. Prove your love to them right now. Let them know how you'll forgive them if they just turn their hearts back to you. Let them know how you can't wait to open the winds of, of heaven upon their life and pour out such a blessing they cannot contain. Come on, God, show off a little bit right now. That's his prayer. God, answer me by fire, verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, all of it. And it also licked up the water in the trench. That's God showing off. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord, he is God. The people responded, the people came back to God. It was time for them to reestablish priority with God. It was time to reignite their passion for God and finally to reengage the purposes of God. And I close with just a couple more verses. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You and I are called to walk this out and make a difference. Friends, if you wanna keep the fire going, <clears throat> Do something with it. Just keep doing something. You get a, an idea in your head, you're standing in a grocery store line, 
pay for that person's food. That's not you thinking that, and that's certainly not the devil. The Lord's just calling you out. Just do some things that make a difference. I should get involved in a ministry. Well, that's not you thinking about that. You would rather watch sports. Go do what the Lord God called you to do. And when you step out and use the gifts that God has given you, God begins to pour blessing upon your life in a way you could never imagine. So when the people responded to God, God responded to them. Verse 40 and 41, final verses. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. And Elijah said to Ahab, this is amazing to me, go eat and drink for there is the sound of heavy rain. Man, I would have killed Ahab. I, why not? He's the leader of the pack, not God. I don't know why, I don't understand why, but it's the God that we serve that pours mercy and goodness and allows the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. And just because your life is so blessed, others are gonna get the, the spillover of your life around you, and soon maybe they will turn to God. And they have, he tried. He turned to God, and that night, that, that evening, he gave his heart back to God. There's no doubt about it, because he knew that he was in big trouble. I don't know about his wife Jezebel. I don't think anything happened there. And what happened? They went outside, and you, the next story, we'll talk about it later. He kept looking out, and there's no rain, there's no rain. He said, then he looked out, and he saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand. He said, get ready. It's about ready to pour, and God send the rain upon his people. And I'm telling you, friends, he will do it again in your life if you simply respond to what he's called you to do. Would you stand for closing prayer?